Well, I hope you've been blessed already uh, from our worship, from our time together, uh, the things we've been able to do as a community of faith. Um, just want to pray now that we would continue in a spirit of fellowship and worship as we get into God's word. Heavenly Father, I just dedicate my heart to you right now. I have nothing that I can share of any value here, Lord. Only The only thing that matters right now is that people hear from you. So Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. We are still uh, without a projector, um, and that's why we're using the, the TV on stage. I know it's not ideal, um, and it creates uh, uh, the pros and cons to having the video or the, uh, the TV on stage, but we're thankful that we at least have a visual uh, that we can provide, and, and we're looking forward to improving in our, uh, in our production over time, but um, that's why we are using the TV screen, in case you're wondering why the big screen isn't being used in front um, of the uh, of the stage here. Last week, I started uh, a, a new series, actually, of talks really related to our identity and our mission of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. And I went to, um, as Pastor Jean mentioned, wherever you are, right there, uh, the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, uh, because they are so pivotal to our identity and to our mission and to our structure of who we are as a people. And uh, I tried to give the, the introduction of that uh, of the series last week and emphasizing really the importance of all of us being involved in the three angels message, all of us embracing what it means to have convictions that the three angels message apply to us. And so over the next uh, couple of Sabbaths, I'm going to continue uh, developing that idea. Um, and where is Toby again? Thank you. And I could use another one. So Jaden or Jacob, one of you? Our trained audio technician experts are now going to uh, help me out with the kids quiz. It's going to be a little different today for our young people, for our kids. I always have a little interactive time at the beginning of my message by asking a series of questions. And if you would like to answer, raise your hand and, and uh, Jaden or Toby will bring the mic so people at home can hear, so everyone in the sanctuary can hear. And um, this just kind of sets the tone for the message. So it's going to be a little different today, though. I, I, I hope that you will... Uh, see where I'm going. If I was to say to you, may the force be with you, what context would that be from? I, I, I think I saw Dylan just put his hand up a little gingerly, but we're going to see if Dylan can help us out here. Star Wars. What is it? Star Wars. Star Wars. Well, you guys are really separated today, aren't you? You know, okay. Yeah, you know, I don't know if ever before Star Wars, if people walked around using that phrase. I think Star Wars kind of enshrined uh, that phrase. And if you understand our culture, if you know anything about, you know, the industry and entertainment, you're going to recognize without ever anyone telling you Star Wars, if you're just familiar with it, if you hear that phrase, you're going to think of Star Wars. All right. If I was to say, just do it, does that engender any thoughts of, of, of any context that you would uh, uh, place there? What would you say, Abel? Oh, the black mic, is that one working, guys? Give it another try. All right, I, I guess that one's not working. Hey, Toby, why don't you grab this one here? How about, how about the blue-gray? Well, I can't do it or else my mic will say something in it. Hello. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you for your indulgence as we, we get this. All right, go ahead. Say it again, Abel. Nike. Nike. Of course, that's their slogan. Just do it. It's not that anyone hadn't said it before. It's not that you can't say it in other contexts. But for the most part, if you understand our culture, you understand our, our uh, you know, uh, products and merchandise, that slogan is fairly well owned by the, the Nike Corporation. Okay. Cowabunga. No, no, you're, uh, you're part of the team here, so A.B. is going to tell us. Yes, I mean, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Who would have thought, you know, in the 1980s that, that any story would capture the imagination of people like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Now, the term cowabunga did exist before them. 
I don't know if you know this. I spent many a pastoral hour researching this. This actually originates from Howdy Doody. Did you know that? The 1950s or, or even earlier, Howdy Doody, the old uh, kids cartoon show. Uh, cowabunga. But in our parlance today, in our usage today, if you hear that phrase, it's unlikely that you're not going to understand, uh, if, if you know our culture, that that comes from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay, we're going to go to a couple of different, slightly different terms. If you were to hear this, one small step for man, but one giant leap for mankind, does that engender any connections to you? Or are we just talking about, you know, out on the golf course, one small step? And, okay, I see Kyle over here. Oh, and then, okay. Is that, okay, Anita, you want to say it? She's working on it. She's thinking about it. Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. Is she right? She is. The moon landing, Neil Armstrong. 1969. By the way, uh, Neil Armstrong and I share the same birthday. I've always enjoyed knowing that. He's born exactly 50 years before me, so he's a little older. But yeah, that phrase, we know that from our history and our culture. And when you hear it, you're immediately uh, uh, brought to your attention of what that means. You, you kind of see the pattern I'm going for. One more, just last one. If you were to hear someone say, oh, say, can you see? Does that bring to mind anything? Uh, does that connect with anything from our culture? I see Kyle up here. Um, Jaden, Kyle's over here. And if Kyle maybe needs some help, we'll come to a dawn. Kyle? America. America! America! Anything more specific or just America? Say it. The national anthem. Oh, he said the national anthem. Adon, did you want to say something too? National anthem. The national anthem. We also call it the Star Spangled Banner. All right, that, that is the, the end of the, the, the kids portion here. Thank you for all of our young people. Now, the reason I use this as my intro, the reason why I began uh, by using these phrases and slogans and quotes that most of us, if you have been awake or engaged in American culture and life and history at all, you also could identify where these come from. Now, the reason why I do this is because when we come to the book of Revelation, when we come, well, not just to Revelation, but particularly the biblical book of Revelation, we have to understand that this book came to us in a culture and context that was ingrained into uh, into the believers and the Jewish nation when it was written. About 75%, 75% of the book of Revelation are direct quotes, allusions, or references or, uh, from the Old Testament. So when you're reading the book of Revelation, you cannot escape. It, it would be inappropriate to ignore or neglect the context for which the messages from Revelation come from. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? So when Revelation mentions some fantastic element, some, some vision, you know, Jesus is pictured in, in, in chapter one with his eyes uh, on fire and his feet of bronze and all that, that comes from the context of an Old Testament uh, a vision that Daniel had. These, these are connections, and we have to try to make those connections. Revelation is the end of, of our Bibles. It's the bookend. It's the last chapter, as it were, of the story that God has given to us. And if you want to understand the end of a story, you have to get back into the, into the beginning and the middle, right? If you just start watching a movie and you watch the last 10 minutes, did you get the whole point of the movie? Probably not. And this is so vitally important. And so many of us so many, you know, wonderful believing individuals have gone astray because in their studies of Revelation, they have not understood this principle that when you read these passages, you have to attempt to see it from the historical and biblical context out of which it comes. Now that applies to, you know, uh, not just the Revelation, but everything we do, we need to understand its context. But in particular, revelation was given to a people and a world and a culture that understood these things from the perspective of the Old Testament. So that's going to be very important as we study the three angels' messages. And again, 
um, uh, just to remind ourselves how it begins in Revelation 14, 6. I saw another angel flying in the mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This gospel is an eternal gospel and it is a worldwide gospel. It is meant for all people and all people are invited and encouraged and to some degree expected. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you are a believer, you have been called and empowered to share this. In the last days, there will be renewed passion and power to share the gospel with all. Now, it's always been God's plan to have his people be participants in sharing the good news. This isn't new, but God knew in his understanding of human nature, in his understanding of the future, that over time, as the Christian church went from Jerusalem and into the Roman world, and then as time went on and there was persecution and there was a dark ages and there was an inquisition and there was persecution, that the, the gospel message would get largely muddled and lost. The essence of the gospel would be preserved and there would always be a people who would fundamentally understand what the message of Jesus Christ was. But as the world went through all the ages it has gone through from 2000 years from Jesus Christ till now, God knew that he needed to instigate a renewed awakening, a new passion, a new power for the gospel shortly before he was going to return. The earth would not simply just trudge along without any uh, special emphasis until the day of Christ's return. That there would be a need and a necessity for a people to grasp with renewed vigor the truth of what God's gospel power is. And that truth would not be restricted or restrained to a small group of people, but it would truly be a worldwide phenomenon. And if you're sitting in this church today and you are part of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, you are part of this. We among all peoples have seen such great power and inspiration from these passages of Scripture. Um, and by the way, and, and as I have you know, been uh, researching and reading the commentaries, we get mocked for this. It's really quite interesting. How other groups, other denominations really pick on the Seventh-day Adventist church when it comes to the three angels message. Most evangelical or historical commentaries, they kind of treat the three angels message as kind of a footnote. And they say, oh yeah, just before Jesus comes, these messages go on, but really nothing to see here. Move along, move along. It's the gospel and, and it's bad when it comes to uh, the mark of the beast and all that, but there's really nothing there. But we as a, as a group and as a movement and as an organization have, have viewed this with a much different perspective. And in our study and in our application of this, we have got, gotten enormous uh, uh, inspiration to be involved in the gospel ministry in the last days. Now, I'm going to do something I don't usually do right now. I'm going to summarize very briefly you know, and from a very general way the three angels' messages um, and then we're going to get into them uh, as, as, uh, as the, the sermon series goes on the rest of the month. But I'm just going to give you a quick summary, of, as I would, and, and there's many different ways of doing this, but this would be my way of summarizing the three angels' message. The first angel says, the God who made you loves you and he's worthy of worship. I kind of got an amen over there. I mean, that's a good thing, isn't it? Uh, that's the eternal gospel. The God who made you loves you and that makes him worthy of worship. Now, there's going to be more to it than that. We're going to delve into it a little bit more. But when you really summarize it and boil it down, that's the first angel's message. The God who made you loves you and he's worthy of worship. The second angel's message, the things of this world, the religions, the governments, the philosophies, powers, they're not going to last forever. They're failing. They're falling. They are temporary. They are fragile. You should not trust in them. That's the second angel's message. Watch out. Watch what you're attaching yourself to. If it's the things of this earth, if it's all these things, uh, they're not going to last. And the third angel's message is really so you have a choice. You can either run to Jesus and receive everlasting life, or you can cling to, to this world and perish. Those are the three basic elements of the eternal gospel in the last days. Those are the three messages that we have been entrusted with in the last days to remind and invite the world to remember the creator God and to make him the center of your life, to remove yourself from trusting in the fragile things of this world and removing yourself from, from being too implanted in the things of this world and to run to Jesus. That's the three angels message in a nutshell 
Um, but again, we want to we want to uh, parse it out a little bit more, and I want to spend some more time looking at this. So, in a way, the three angels' message is no different than what Jesus told Nicodemus in John three sixteen. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him is not going to perish but have everlasting life. The eternal gospel that we have in these days is the same gospel that Jesus taught His disciples in His day. It's the same message, packaged a little bit different given a little bit different context, but it's the same essential message. It is still the gospel that Jesus taught and that the Old Testament taught and the entire Bible is consistent in teaching. So let's just look at this um, just briefly. I have a few minutes to spend with you, maybe an hour, we'll go from there. Okay, and we've read this. By the way, for us as Adventists, we love the first angel's message. We love it. It's so, it's so easy. It's straightforward. It has the easiest language, doesn't require as much explanation. So we spend more time as, a, as an organization really loving the first angel's message, and we sometimes give a little bit of lip service to the second and third. But we're going to get into all of them, and I think we're going to see that the gospel is true and consistent in all three of them, and we can say hallelujah. But just notice this for a moment. It says that this angel, which last week I shared, is just a symbolic way of referring to God's people who are sharing his message. That's all of us. He said with what kind of a voice? A loud voice. The three angels' message, the eternal gospel that's to go out to the world in the last days is not timid. It is not passive. It is not simply something that, that we are to learn through osmosis. It is to be shared with a loud voice. Now, I have a fairly loud voice at times. I can, I can get loud at times. I'm still uh, 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 dealing with a little bit with uh, fatigue from, from my recent cold. Um, but the idea being is that we should be bold. Amen? Amen? We should be proud. We should be energetic. We should be passionate about who we are as a people, about what God has done in our lives. And it's through that passion and through that power that the message should go out. It should not be a message of timidity. It should be a message of power. This message goes out with a loud voice, filled with power, filled with joy, filled with courage, filled with conviction. When is it that you talk loud? When you're passionate, right? When you're excited. Sometimes when you're angry, you talk loud. And I'm not saying we should be angry about it, but we understand the context here. This is important. All of these elements tell us something a little bit about it. And then the message is, is what, again, we're familiar with. Fear God, give him glory. The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. That's the first angel's message. The angel that holds the everlasting gospel. The gospel to, that, to go out to all the world, every nation, tongue, tribe, and people. But here is the message. Okay. Now, again, I, I know this is going to be somewhat redundant for some of you. It's going to be somewhat repetitive. For those of you who've grown up in the faith and maybe you've studied this many times in Sabbath school and other places. But I think it's worth our time just to, to break this down into its parts and spend just a few moments on. There's three basic statements in the first angel's message. The first one is to fear God and give him glory. Now, that is not a superior, you know, unique statement. You can find that same sentiment or that same idea. I mean, it's plastered all over scripture. But when you uh, understand it, again, in the context of the final message of God, and when you see how, how it develops uh, within Revelation 12, 13, and 14, I think, and I would present before you today and submit to you that this message is a direct repudiation to the first lies that the devil told Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, this idea of fear of God is found out all throughout the Bible. Uh, you know, one of the places you can see it is in uh, the, the offering of Isaac, right before Abraham drops the knife, you know, and is going to slay his son. The angel cries out and says, do not lay your hand against the son and do nothing to the lad. For now I know that you... Fear God because you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. So the whole concept of fearing God is understanding his superiority and power and living in obedience to his will. Okay, so that is that is one of the, 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 the things that we see when we come to fear God. But if you remember in the Garden of Eden, there were two things that the serpent uh, 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 tricked Eve with when he talked with her. The first one is he said, has God said? The first thing he said is he, he said, let's question God. Let's not fear God. Let's not take God serious. Let's question God. Let's doubt God. It's the very opposite of fearing God. And then when she said, yeah, we're not supposed to eat the tree in the midst of the garden or touch it, 
for if we do, we're going to die. Then he outright lied and said, you're not going to die. That's the opposite of giving glory to God. Giving glory to God is acknowledging the truth of who he is. Giving glory to God is worshiping his integrity, trusting him. So I would submit to you that the first part of the uh, first angel's message is the exact repudiation of the first lies and the first deceptions that the devil used to trip up humanity, which only makes sense that the first message in the last days is to reject the, the false message that we originally were presented with in the book of Genesis. To fear God is to acknowledge his power and superior, superiority over you and to, and to align yourself in righteousness and obedience to him and to acknowledge his integrity. That's what it means to give glory to God. Do you remember when um, Achan sinned in the book of Joshua? So as the children of Israel come out of the wilderness and they're beginning to come into the promised land, first they attack Jericho and they're very successful. But God had said, you're not to take any uh, spoils from that. That is all dedicated to destruction. But Achan said, I can't help myself. There's too many wonderful things in this city. So Achan sinfully uh, took some spoils from Jericho. So when the children of Israel attacked the next city, Ai, God said, I'm not going to be with you. You're violating my command. And they were unsuccessful. So when they investigated, why was God with us at, at Jericho, but not at Ai? They, 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 they cast lots and they found out that Achan had, um, it is Achan, right? Right. Okay, Jeff, I just I had a brain that went the opposite way for a second. Achan they said, Achan, what have you done? And, they, and Joshua says to Achan in that story, give glory to God and tell the truth. Okay? Telling the truth, giving glory to God means to acknowledge the truth about who God is. Similar thing happened in the book of John when Jesus healed the man who was uh, born blind. And the Pharisees didn't want to believe him. They see the man who had been healed and they say, how did this happen? And he said, a man uh, healed me. And they say to him, give glory to God and tell the truth. Giving glory to God means to acknowledge the truth of who he is and what his word says in your life. It doesn't just mean singing songs and saying, oh God, you're glorious. I'm giving you glory. Okay, I was raised Pentecostal. We, we did a lot of glory in our singing. And that's fine. That's fine. Ben, it's Okay. But there's a deeper biblical meaning to fear God and give him glory. It's to acknowledge his word, be obedient to him, his superiority and power, and to trust the Lord God. Is that okay with you? Is that all right? All right. So again, I think that this is a direct... Again, we, when we understand the context, that Revelation was not written in a vacuum, that the, con, that the conflict between the serpent and the woman has already been referenced in Revelation 12... So it's not out of left field to say that this is a repudiation of the first lies of the devil. The second part of the first angel's message says, for the hour of his judgment has come. You notice that. Not is coming, but is now. The hour of his judgment is taking place now. It's not something in the future. It is happening now. And again, if you're a first century Jew and you're thinking about a worldwide message and a worldwide judgment, the, the natural story that would come to you is the story of Noah. Noah, who pronounced, Peter says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah didn't just build an ark and say, don't bother me, don't ask me why I'm doing it. I'm just building an ark because God told me to. God used Noah in that day of judgment to present the gospel. And Noah was going around telling people, I'm building this ark for you. That's why I'm building it. And they said, you're crazy, Noah. This, this, this is never going to happen. We can do whatever we want. And he says, no, the Lord God has come to me and he's asked me to build this and it's for you. That would be what uh, any first century Jew, when you're thinking of the context of worldwide judgment and the worldwide gospel, the memory of Noah would come to your mind. So the question then is, if this is a reference to a similar reality of a worldwide judgment that is in process, and it invokes the idea of Noah. And that in the story of Noah, God had provided an ark of safety. God had provided a means of salvation. Then what is the ark in the first angel's message? What is the means of salvation? Why pronounce there's judgment, but not say that there is security and salvation to be found? The gospel says that God has provided that salvation can be made available to all. So the first angel's message warns the judgment is here, 
But God has provided an ark of salvation, and that's the last statement. The worldwide judgment recalls the time of Noah and the flood. The invitation then to worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water is God's declaration of in this moment of judgment, in this moment of worldwide uh, 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 challenges that we're facing, knowing that this world is not going to last forever, knowing that we need to fear God and give him glory, this is your ark of safety. This is the provision that I've given. This is the explanation of how you can show your allegiance to God and not to the things of this world. The challenge in the last days and the challenge has always been in the biblical record about worship. Who do you worship? Who did Cain worship? Who did Abel worship? Who did, how did people worship during Babel? How did they worship? The issue has always been an issue of what are you attaching your ultimate allegiance to? A lot of people worship themselves. But God says in the first angel's message, I have made you, I love you, and I'm worthy of you attaching yourself to me because I'm the only one who can give you eternal life. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. God, and, and so that's an inclusive way of saying, I made everything, by the way. You know, he doesn't say the animals and doesn't say you, but it's God's way of saying, I am responsible. I am the creator. I've done everything. I have made you. I have made the whole world. But again, we cannot just look at this in a vacuum and say, oh, uh, this is just a wonderful reminder that we need to remember that God made us. And if we just remember God made us, then that makes everything well. This is given in a language and in a context and a vocabulary that the Jewish people and those who had been studying their Bibles would recognize immediately. That phrase, made the heavens and the earth and the sea, is an exact quote in the Greek, the Greek New Testament in Revelation to the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, from one passage of Scripture in Exodus chapter 20. It's the Sabbath command. Just like I shared with you earlier. So it says in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. That is the exact quote. Okay? If I was to say to you, we the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, would you kind of recognize what that? If I was to say to you, um, um, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and have been um, um, given certain unalienable rights. I'm, I'm not getting it right. Would you kind of have an idea? If I was to say to you um, that the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. I used to have that whole thing memorized for us. Now I got like the last eight words. Now you may not be a devoted student of American history. You may say, I kind of got it. It sounds maybe, maybe that's the Constitution. Maybe that's the Declaration of Independence. Maybe that's the Gettysburg Address. Okay. But if you were a student of history, if you studied American history day in and day out, you would know those quotes right off the top of your head. The point that I'm making is that the Jews were to study the law every single day. They were to devote the law to memory. They were to write it on their doorposts. They were to commit it to their hearts. They were to teach it to their children from their rising up to their setting down as Hebrews or as as. Um, Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 6 talks about, they were to be totally absorbed with understanding the character of God that's found in the law. So just as certain quotes you might recognize from American history, there is no devoted Jew who would have heard that first angel's message that exactly quoted, exactly quoted the Sabbath command that would not have brought to mind that worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, would have immediately thought, I know what he's talking about. I know what he's talking about. He just quoted from the Sabbath command. He quoted for it word for word. The Sabbath command is inferred and quoted in the first angel's message. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea is not just a generic statement of, of, of just individual acknowledgement that God is your creator, it is a reminder and an invitation to the believer to reinvest in understanding the day that God has set aside to recognize him as the creator. It is a reminder of the Sabbath. And I hear people say, well, why didn't God just say in the first angel's message, 
fear God and give him glory, and the hour of his judgment has come, and keep the Sabbath. Why didn't God just say that? Because God invites us to study this out for ourselves. God wants us to go on this journey of of searching our scriptures and comparing it and being able to see it in its grander context. Later on, he'll tell us later, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So he specifically quotes from the Sabbath and he invites us. He says, the ark of safety that I provided in the last days is a return to fidelity and faithfulness to serving the Lord in the context of not just the Sabbath command, but all of his commands. Notice how the Sabbath is presented in the Old Testament. You shall observe my Sabbath because they're a sign between me and your generation that I'm the God who sanctifies you. Keeping the Sabbath doesn't sanctify you. Keeping the Sabbath acknowledges that God sanctified you. Do you see the difference? This is not legalism. This is just saying, I'm going to live my life acknowledging what God has done for me. And he's asked me to obey him. And and Ezekiel is similar. Also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. The Sabbath is the sign of God's sanctification on his people. And the third angel's message will warn us about the sign that the world will take that leads only to destruction. So God invites us in the first angel's message to receive the blessing and the worship and the ark of safety that is found in observing God's miraculous and wonderful law, including the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is specifically quoted and inserted into this. And the Bible student, any Jew that was studying their Bibles and knew the law, would have immediately recognized that. Worship him. What does it mean? If, if, if it's not the Sabbath, what does it mean to worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea? What, what, where is the biblical meaning of that if it's not the Sabbath? Do we plant a little... Flower and say God made the dirt and now the flower comes. What, you just make it up as you go along? God has given us the context. He's already explained to us what it means to worship the creator God. And he's enshrined it in his law. And in the last days, this is going to be part of the promise of security and safety to those who have received the message of the first angel. The first angel's message is, again, who is your God? Do you fear him? Do you glorify him in your life? Will you worship him? And will you accept his ark of salvation and sanctification? Will you acknowledge that he is your creator and allow his spirit to work in your heart as you align yourself with his will and his expectation and his law? Who is your God? Will you worship? And will you accept his sign of salvation, his ark of salvation, which he himself says is keeping the Sabbath? Is that something worth praying about? There's more to this, friends. And as we get into the second and third angel's message, this will continue to develop and bring greater context and clarity. Let me pray with you now. Heavenly Father, I know we went through a lot of material, and I can get kind of fast and and jump around a little bit, Lord, but I pray that your Holy Spirit has been the one speaking to hearts today. I pray that it would be your scriptures and the power of your truth that is really setting into everyone's minds and hearts today. And I know that some of the things we share will not always be popular. In our age and in our world, there, are, uh, uh, there is a resistance to things that would set us apart and be peculiar. But Lord, we want to be faithful to your scriptures. We want to repudiate the lies of the devil and not question your integrity. We want to bring our, li- our lives into alignment with your will. 